good evening. This is Ken Kreitzer for Sons of the American Legion Radio, our Army football <clears throat> huddle. And uh, tonight we're going to talk about what happened Saturday at the Meadowlands, a 17 to 13 win by Navy, something none of us on this program saw, ha saw coming. And uh, disappointing day, Army was leading uh, after the first quarter at halftime. 13 to seven, and then the second half was dominated by the Naval Academy. Now to discuss the game, uh, we've got with us from our Sons of the American Legion team, Jack McGurk and Richard Miller. How are you both? Very Doing well, how are you? Good, good, Jack was with me. I uh, took some great video um, at the game and uh, before the march-ons and also for the post-game uh, with the coach and uh, from the Beat Navy studio in Huntsville, Alabama, we've got Colonel Sam Houston from the class of 87. How are you, Colonel? I, I, I have to ask that cautiously. It could be a complicated answer. <laughs> uh, not doing well, Ken. And uh, it may take some time to see the wounds heal on uh, the disappointing egg that was laid on the uh, MetLife Stadium. Okay. A strike this past Saturday. Okay, well, let's uh, introduce Steve Shalou from the class of 92, former Army football player from South Jersey. Steve, how are you tonight? I, again, ask it the question very cautiously. I'm in, uh, I'm in all black, and it's not because I'm a Johnny Cash fan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well... It was something that, I, you know, uh, we talked to Coach Munkin uh, today in his one o'clock media session, and I brought up, I first commented about Kamanti Yao having a solid game on defense, uh, 13 tackles, and also the play Chris Frey and Nolan Cockrell made at the end to uh, force a Navy punt to give Army one more chance. But uh, the net was Army had, after the first quarter, 49 yards rushing and uh, only three first downs in the second half. And uh, the fullbacks uh, together, getting once you got past Jacoby Buchanan, uh, who had a good day, but he only got the ball four times, uh, was 30 yards. Um, who would like to start on, on the uh, postmortem? Uh, Sam, do you want to? Uh... Well, Sam's uh, still, uh... why don't we go with Jack? Jack, you were there in person. Uh, what would you say? Uh, it was a big surprise for the game. I remember you know, we were on the field for, uh, you know, right before the game started, the national anthem and the flyover, which is pretty incredible. Um, but we were heading back up to the press box uh, while the kickoff was happening. And just as we were getting back to our seats, uh, we find out that Christian Anderson just ran 56 yards for a touchdown. And <laughs> wow, that was fast. Uh, so we all kind of thought, okay, well, this is how the game's going to go. I guess this is going to be, um, you know, an easy win for Army. Uh, but then um, after that, things seemed to calm down, and you know, Army went into the locker room with a thirteen to seven uh, lead. Uh, but then in the second half, I, I don't know what Coach Neil Matololo did, um, but Navy made adjustments and they were able to keep um, you know Army scoreless in the second half. And I remember uh, we went to the post game press comments after the game. And Coach Munkin, before any questions were asked, he sat down and said, we were out coached and outplayed. And um, he talked about the uh, you know, blocking wasn't doing too well. And uh, people were asking about the, uh, maybe, I think maybe you asked a question about um, the play calling and stuff. And he kind of said, you know, we tried every play in the book and it just didn't seem to work. So it was um, kind of a rough game uh, on offense for, uh, for Army. Well, the defense, I thought, played well. Um, and uh, Ty Levitai, their quarterback, um, surprised uh, surprised me with his poise. Now, Sam has been waiting. Um, go ahead, Sam. What, what is your take on on uh, this uh, game? The bluff. Navy took on the role of Army. Army took on the role of Navy. You take the cumulative season that they've had. And Navy out Army, Army. Army played down to Navy and played Navy football. 
And uh, the result you saw on the field, and it's inexcusable. Uh, for once, I actually came to this huddle with notes because as painful as it was to go back through the statistics of this game, I wanted to understand it a little better. And I want to point out that Navy outperformed Army on practically every statistic. First downs, 13 to 11. Third down efficiency. Navy had two of two on fourth downs, if you include the fake punt. And it's a whole other topic to talk about, the delay of game that was not called on that play. Total yards, Navy won. Uh, they did not win the passing yard statistic, but yards per pass, they doubled Army. And who would have thought that Navy would have come in and rushed for 196 yards versus Army 124? They bo both teams averaged 3.8 a carry. Time of possession. Navy kept the ball for almost a full 10 minutes more than Army and ran almost 10 more plays during the game. And I disagree if Coach Monken actually said we ran every play in the book. No, you didn't. Tell me one time you ran a perimeter play. Tell me one time you did a toss sweep. Tell me one time you did a triple option pitch to the outside. Tell me one time you did a B-back sweep. You didn't. Instead, I told you last week what was going to happen. I said both these teams were going to play it close. The team that flinched and panicked was the team that was going to lose. Army came out right out of the gate, punched Navy to the deck. Navy didn't flinch. They got right back up, and they drove right down the field, and they showed grit and determination and scored a touchdown on a long drive. Army got in the, the red zone two more times in the second half. All they could produce for that was two field goals. Then in the second half, it opened up with Navy punching Army in the face, knocking Army to the deck. And what did Army do? Completely abandon the inside game with gimmick plays, pass plays, nothing to, uh, to attack the perimeter. And as a result, oh, and we'll talk about the quarterback rotation thing in, in another comment, because that's another topic I've got to discuss. Ultimately, it was Army that flinched. And when I say mistakes, I don't just mean committing a turnover or costly penalty, because quite frankly, neither team committed a turnover, and there were hardly any penalties. But when Army had the ball in the second half, they did not play Army's game. They didn't adjust. They didn't go with a game plan that works. They did not play Army football, and they suffered the consequence. They did exactly what every other team who lost to Navy this season did. They let Navy hang in there and hang in there and hang in there and then get beat down. And that's what happened to Army. And that was the story of the day. Okay. Okay. Well, let's give uh, Steve Shalou a chance to uh... – uh, offer his observations. Steve, it just seemed like the offensive line couldn't open up holes and the Army offense uh, rushing game was really anemic. And except for, and, and, I, and as someone said on Twitter, why didn't they give the ball to Jacoby Buchanan more than four times if the four times he, they did, he got six yards of carry? Uh, yeah. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm I'm having a difficult time with this one over the weekend. I um, I packed my packed my hotel room up, drove all the way home. Uh, did not pass go. Did not collect two hundred dollars. Um, I just needed to be around no one. I needed to be uh, uh, locked in seclusion, and I just needed to spend time with my daughter because that gave me happiness. A lot of what Sam Sam said was true. Uh, I applaud the players. I think that they're a great group. Uh, I love each and every one of them. I think, you know, they, <clears throat> they, 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 they put their hearts out there. Uh, I don't think the play calling was where it needed to be. I, I, you know, we just didn't get the ball outside. I, I, I sound like a broken record. You know, when we needed to switch it up, we switched it up to the pass, and we're not a pass-oriented offense. 
We just got to get that ball outside. And early in the season, I talked about over under of a dozen times getting the ball outside. We were over under of zero. Um, and, and it just tightened everything up. And and it was very we, – we, we were tight. We were tight calling plays. Uh, and, and you just – you sat there and you looked up and it was five minutes left to go in the game. And you're wondering when they were going to turn it on, when we were going to be able to win this ball game. You just kind of – I would say enough is enough and go through with it. And it didn't happen. And, you know, it, the disappointing thing is, is that they've got a lot of really good kids on that team. And uh, they, they, you know, uh, they have to live with this the rest of their lives. You know, as, as, as I do, we, we lost our senior year too. And it doesn't go, it doesn't, doesn't make it easy. Um, and all we can do at this point in time is, is to learn from it. And uh, we've got enough bulletin board material after Fago opened his trap and decided to be uh, who he is and, and that type of person that he is. And that will follow him as he moves through the military because we are intertwined. And, and, and there will be people that won't forget uh, that, that, uh, that the lack of sportsmanship and, and whatever else he has going on. Um, but I will tell you that uh, it's a shame for these seniors. And, and, but, but I think that they, they'll pick up, dust themselves off. And hopefully in the bowl game that we just get out there and kind of say, you know what, this is an exhibition game. And let's fly around and let's toss the ball maybe. Maybe pitch it. Maybe do a triple option. It says on paper that we're a triple option team. I, I hear there's a rumor that we are, but I don't see it. I haven't seen it, and we should have been this game, and it didn't happen. So um, as Bill Belichick said, we're on to Cincinnati. Well, that's what Coach Munkin was saying uh, today. He was talking up the, the uh, bowl game, the Missouri opportunity. Uh, his players are all in exams now. It's exam week at West Point. Richard, what was your take on the game from Florida? I, I, ju I just saw a game where I, I just thought that Navy was, Navy was playing like the way Army has during this season, and Army was looking like Navy. They look... They were like each other, but but up, but opposite. I mean, Army could not could not get any, anything going. Navy's de Navy's defense really sh really shut them down. It's going it's gonna ha it's gonna happen. But in in the in these games, it's tough. It's tough. Uh, it's like the it's like the performance did not did not live did not live up. I mean, I, I well, going through, going through the game game stats and. Going through the game stats, first down, Navy's 13, Army's 11. There's a, a diff, and even third down efficiency. Navy converted on 6 of 15, while Army competed uh, 4, of, 4 of 12. Navy was, perp Navy was perfect on, on fourth down. Army got only one, four, one fourth down. They did, they did not pass the ball as much as Army did, while well, completed attempts 182. Navy... The team that makes the least a least amount of mistakes and the and the uh, and the cleanest amount of plays is going to win and and that and that and that was Navy. Army tried to hang in there, but unfortunately they, they couldn't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I just am struck by the number of punts. Two in the first half, the first three drives of the second half, they only got the ball four times uh, for Army, and the first three uh, were punts. And as Coach Munkin said, they were they all three were uh, three and outs or five and outs, and uh, not much productivity. Uh, how about the uh, Navy quarterback? Um, you know, uh, Xavier Arley got hurt early in the game. Hamstring. It was not an option. Um, and we thought uh, that Ty Levitai, uh got hurt also, but he came back in the game. But he ran for sixty-seven yards. Um, and he passed for, uh, you know, four or six for 82 yards and made some plays when they needed to. You know, what's interesting is there were no fumbles and no interceptions in this game. It was pretty cleanly played. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but Army just couldn't get the fullbacks going. Um, and as you said, they were, you know, they gave the ball to Tyrell Robinson seven times, but uh, not much productivity, 21 yards and not much. Why do we think the offense got so conservative or why did they hold off on giving – they tried to get Tyson Riley going. He had two uh, – he only got two yards on one attempt. Anthony Atkins had three rushes for three yards. 
Um, but Jacoby, you know, he got 24 and four carries, six a carry. And I would have ridden him uh, as long as um, he could be productive. Um, you know, he's a tough guy to stop, even if you know he's going to get the ball. Yeah, Ken, the, the only person, the, the only people who can answer your question is uh, Jeff Munkin and Brent Davis. The players can't answer that question. And I'm going to correct you. It wasn't that Army could not get the b going. It was that Army didn't run the b -backs. They only carried the ball eight times total in the entire game. That's true. Why is it that we have why is it that we have three 260-pound fullbacks and we're not giving them the ball? You know, you've got Diego Fago sitting there crashing the line in the center. The triple option, if you're actually running a triple option, is supposed to work inside to out. Army totally abandoned that from the start. It was as though they surrendered the middle of the field to Diego Fago and tried to run quarterback midline options and, and midline zone reads the entire game because the quarterbacks carried the ball 18 times. Now, statistically, they ran it 18 times for 75 yards. But you subtract that 56-yard run that uh, Christian Anderson had on the very first drive, our quarterbacks uh, averaged one yard a carry on 17 carries. OK, where was the outside game? Why did we surrender the entire inside of the field, the middle of the field to Diego Fago when we should have been busting his ass with some trap blocking and running the B-back and shoving it down their throat? If you've got B-backs averaging 3.5 yards a carry in their combined carries, 3.5 yards a carry keeps us on schedule. You can run 3.5 yards a carry all day long. That's Army football. We did not play Army football. Now, on the subject of quarterbacks, Navy stuck with the same quarterback the whole game. I sure wish Army had because I'm going to use this as a moment to talk about this entire game that we've been playing all season about swapping out quarterbacks every game. It came back to bite us in the Navy game. And when you've got Christian Anderson running a drive, and I'm specifically talking about the first quarter, and you get into the red zone, and then you pull him and put in Tyre Tyler, what happened? The offense went backwards, and we had to settle for field goals. Because the point is, Navy has Tyre Tyler's identical twin to run the prep squad. His name is Xavier Arline. He looks exactly like Tyre Tyler. He's built exactly the same. He can run the exact same limited offense that Tyre Tyler runs every game, which is keep the ball, barely hand off to the quarterback every now and then, and run with the ball and get tackled and stuffed. So, and when you, when you substitute these quarterbacks like that, it disrupts the momentum of the drive. When you put in a quarterback who is not your best quarterback, He's an athlete, yes. He's got grit, yes. Is he fast? Yes. But let me point, point this out to you. He's 5'7", less than 180 pounds. He is not, uh, he is not a Mod Bradshaw. Um, and he's not going to be able to be a fourth running back in the backfield. He can't do it. He's not built for it. So I'm going to stand on the side of actually questioning the coaches and pleading with the coaches. Please, in this experiment, please have a number one quarterback. Stick with your number one quarterback. Let the offense run its full playbook. Please, if you want to have Tyre Tyler it, uh, provide his athleticism on the field, put him in space, move him back to slot back where he belongs, and keep him there. Christian Anderson should have been the start of the entire game, and he wasn't. And, Sam, uh, how many plays was Tyre in for, do you think? I don't know how many exact plays was, but I know his statistics, nine carries for eight yards. 
Well, yeah, now, I mean, he, he probably carried the ball. ran it a lot. Why is Tyre Tyler running the ball more than all of the B-backs combined? Why did Tyler Ty Tyre Tyler touch the ball more than uh, uh, Tyler Robinson? And why did Brahim Murphy never even touch the ball? Yeah, I mean, the only Falconac who got the ball was Tyrell Robinson. Uh, they just didn't get a lot of drives. I mean, look at what they did in the second quarter. The first drive is two Tyrell, uh, uh, Tyre Tyler rushes for a total of three yards, and the Anderson ran for four. And then they had a punt. And then the next drive, uh, they start with a penalty, a false start on the tight end. And Anderson goes incomplete. Anderson is sacked. Anderson runs for three yards. They punt. And then the next drive in the second quarter, um, they uh, have some productivity. Buchanan ran. Uh, Anderson got a completion. Anderson ran a couple of ran one and got the completion to Tyrell Robinson for 23. And then Tyler went in, rushed for two, two, and lost four. And so they had to kick the field goal. So you're right. So they put, in that drive, they put Tyre Tyler in. Um, on the first down, first and 10 at the Navy 15, and they go two yards, two yards, and loss of four. Um, my and question is, field goal. so my question is the question of every single Army fan, why? Why did Christian Anderson come out? Why did Tyler go in? Go back and look at the West Virginia game last year. I mean, my God. You know, uh, and why were the B-backs not being run? This stuff does not make any sense. It does not add up. And I am not certain what the infatuation is with inserting Tyler, Tyler, Tyler in, in these awkward moments in the middle of a momentum of a drive. And you see what happens. I'll tell you when I first knew this, this uh, game was the, in doubt, like big time. And it was uh, when Army still had the lead. In, in the uh, second quarter, uh, Army had to punt. Beautiful punt by Zach Hardy. Went out of bounds right in front of the Corps of Cadets and uh, right in front of where I was sitting in club level front row, man. Right, it was beautiful. Then on the one-yard line, pin Navy in their end zone. The defense holds them to three and out. Navy has to punt. Everyone in the world is thinking when Army gets the ball on the 50 or just inside the 50-yard line, all right, we got it. That we're gonna, we got a short field. We're gonna roll. No, we didn't. We moved backwards and had to punt. And that was the moment that fear and doubt creeped into my head. There's something wrong with the play calling. I mean, at that moment, when Army had the ball first and 10 on the short field in the second quarter, yeah. it should have been the inside game followed by some option plays to, to exploit the perimeter. And just a time the consuming, 80, 15, yeah. It just it, it should have turned into a just a time consuming short drive for another touchdown, but that's not what it was. It turned into a backwards drive where we had to punt and give Navy the ball back. And I knew that we were in trouble. Yeah, I mean that could have been a, a real difference in the game if you would if that first and ten at the fifteen, you pound Jacoby Buchanan a couple of times until they stop him twice, and then go out or go one outside to Tyler. Hey, I mean, my dad, uh, to, uh, uh, Tyrell Robinson. Uh, yeah, what do you my think? Dad coached, uh, my dad coached football for a long, long, long time. And uh, I'll just uh, put this quote out there. My dad's philosophy was all this. Run the same type of play until the defense stops it. If the defense ain't stopping it, keep running it. You're wearing them out. That ain't what Army's been. Army does that a lot, but they weren't doing it this past Saturday. Steve, what did you think about that sequence in the end of the second quarter? First and 10 at the Navy 15, and they rush Tyre three times for a loss for no gain. Um, when they, I don't know, I would have just pounded Jacoby Buchanan until they could stop him twice. I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it was frustrating. That's all. I mean, really, we we just didn't we were so limited in our play calling and uh, I'm not a huge fan of this quarterback committee I, I mean if we're throwing quotes around if you have two quarterbacks you have none uh, that that's that's been said a lot and 
it's hard to get into a rhythm. It's hard to get where we need to be. I don't think it's been successful thus far. I mean, I can see that we want to keep one of them in the game just because it's one of them could get hurt so quickly because they've been fragile for the year. But yeah, this is this is all the marbles though. You've got to go. You've got to. You've got to go with the best possible situation, and it hasn't been. It hasn't been close between Tyre and and Anderson. Anderson has been the. And usually, you get with Anderson, you got a little bit more of an open offense with, with with fit, with pitching and and throwing the ball, and uh, and where the play the plays were limited. You were limited with Tyre. You know, you you got that that darned snap the ball, tuck it, and get creamed and. If I see that play again, my head might explode. And that's the play we lost the game at the end of the game. That was our fourth, that was a fourth down play. Mm-hmm. Snap the ball, tuck it, and get creamed. And that's what happened. Our season went up in that play. And I've been yelling about that play the entire year. We're not even a double option play team at that point. We're a single option team, and the whole world knows it's coming. Mm-hmm. And it bit us. It bit us in the butt. I bet yeah. in the third quarter, um, Navy goes, takes the second half kickoff. Ty Levitai runs the offense, um, and uh, they get the uh, chance Warren 26 yard run on fourth and four. Boy, that one really hurt. And even Coach Munkin said they thought they had him stopped at a first down, but not 26 yards. Mm. Um, and that, that one hurt. But, you know, at that point, it's 14 to 13. And Army does a three and out. Tyrell Robinson goes for one yard. Anthony Atkins, no gain. And Anderson throws an incompletion, so they have to punt. And then, uh, you know, they hold Navy to a punt. And then they then they get the ball back, and they have a, they do a Jacoby Buchanan run for seven. Tyrell goes for three. Tyson Riley goes for two. Tyson uh, Tyer goes for loss of one. Anderson <laughs> goes an incompletion. So not much in that drive. They got one first down due to the Jacoby Buchanan rush on first down. And uh, so it's uh, 14-13 with two unproductive drives in the second and third quarter where they had a punt. What did, that's, you know, they, they, did you see, it seemed like Army couldn't make any adjustments or I still don't understand why they, if they, if Jacoby gets seven yards on first down, why don't you run him again on first down, you know, right after that? Um, he's like one of those players. Is, you know he's coming, but he's still very hard to stop. Well, well, Ken, you're asking the question we're all asking. And this is an example of what I mean when I say the team that flinches is the one that's going to lose. Army flinched in the second half. They panicked. They didn't play Army football. So what if Navy went up by one? You've got Navy exactly where you want them. You get the ball, you play your game, exploit the inside, yeah. run the inside, then hit the outside, and then run the inside. Stay on schedule. Don't rotate the quarterbacks in the middle of a drive. Don't throw passes uh, on first down. Don't do things that are going to put you behind the schedule. And uh, Army offense was playing like they were panicking. Every time they got the ball in the second half, it was as though they were deer in the headlights and they were not running the bread and butter plays that had proven that they worked uh, when they actually ran them, but they abandoned them instead. And it was though they looked up at the clock and when there was still a full quarter to go in the game, they looked at it as though like they only had two minutes to go. And uh, before you know it, Navy keeps getting the ball back. And uh, that just eats more time off the clock, which increased the panic mode, um, reduced the uh, play calling book. And um, before you know it, we're, we're just staring at no time left on the clock and the game's over and Navy won. And it was very frustrating. And you can tell from listening to Steve and me, it, it was beyond frustrating. Yeah, that, you know, you look at it, Navy goes eight minutes to kick the field goal to take a 17 to 13 lead. A lot of that was Ty Levitai running the ball at a 13 yard gain. And uh, the fourth and four, um, well, they, they, had to, they had to uh, kick the field goal. Of course, that, on the first fourth and one, that was when Diego Fago did his four yard uh, run 
off of the not a fake field goal. What what was going on in that? I mean, what did you guys see? That was, yeah, that was pretty uh, amazing. I remember listening to the radio after the uh, game, and Coach Ken said that they did not call a fake field, a fake uh, punt on that uh, play. I guess there was some sort of miscommunication, and the ball was snapped. It went right, like hit Diego Vago right in the helmet, and he was able to hold on to it and run for the first down somehow. I think that was the first carry of his career, by the way. Um, but uh, that was pretty impressive. If he didn't catch that ball, that might have um, set Army up with some really good field position. So that was that's kind of what, a game saver. That's there, what right? Coach Monk was saying. Army would have the ball at the Navy 30-yard line, most likely, if that was became a loose ball. And, and uh, what a turnover mm -hmm. that would have been. But Diego Fago made the play. What did you see happening there, Sam? Well, uh, I don't believe Coach in and his claim that that was not a design play. I think it was. It's just that the execution made it look like they potentially could have fumbled the ball. Um, it was a design play. Navy, Navy went there and put everything they had on the field, something that Army did not do because the coaching plan did not adjust for that and didn't prepare the players for that. So, yeah, Navy planned to do that because Navy came to win and they played to win. Um, about that play, there's a lot of controversy about the play because multiple angles of the play show that the play clock expired before the snap was made, but no call was made. So there's a lot of criticism floating around about the AAC referees that were officiating the game uh, and that they officiated in favor of Navy. And I'm here to tell you that whether or not there was a delay of game on that call that did, on that play that did not get called or not, that play is not what won the game for Navy. The game won the game for Navy, and the officiating did not win the game for Navy. Um, Navy was hungrier, and uh, they laid it all on the line. And in the end, their coaching staff flat out coached Army's coaching staff, who had the real deer in the headlights look in the second half about what to do because they could not figure out what to do. And in the end, uh, that fourth down conversion was one of many daggers that went into the hearts of Army in the second half of that ball game. Well, I mean, it was still only 17 to 13 after that. Uh, but, you know, you look at the next drive, Army gets the ball back at the 25, and Anderson runs for six, Robinson for three, and then Buchanan busts one for 13. And they got the ball almost to midfield. And then an incomplete pass. Uh, Robinson runs for two. Robinson, uh, that, then he does the, the halfback pass or the slotback pass. And would, all they had to do was run Jacoby again on first down and see what he could do. Um, I would have run Jacoby 20 times and, until he was exhausted and, and uh, see what he could do. Because he was Army's best offensive threat, maybe only offensive threat on Saturday. And, uh, I, you know, just surprising. I mean, they, they get paid a lot of money for – coming up with strategy, but it's, you know, if you got somebody like Jacoby Buchanan, I would just run him. But anyway, and then, sure. um, and then Army gets the ball back after the, um, uh, the tackle by Chris Frey and, and Nolan Cockrell uh, to give another chance to the ball. I got 256. And then they basically, they got a pass to the tight end for nine to Cole Catterbone. And then um, uh, not much. What did you think about their two-minute drill? Do you think they just – what was their situation on timeouts? Were you aware of how many timeouts they had at that point? They seemed to play like they were out of timeouts or were saving one. Because oh, they had the ball at the 33 with 256 to play. That's pretty good. Mm-hmm. And they go to Catterbone for one. Then they get a pass incomplete to Tyrell. Then they go three yards um, uh, with Anderson running. Then pass incomplete, incomplete. And, in, and then they get a completion to Robinson for seven yards. Uh, but then Anderson is stopped on fourth and three for a two-yard gain. Um, Again, I, I, you know, in that situation, yeah, it's tough to run. Yeah, there the was, I remember, uh, we were in, and there was a late call. 
there was a, I remember there was a play call uh, while we were down on the field. It looked like a, a halfback pass that Army was pulling off, and it was it ended up being an incomplete pass. But there was another uh, guy next to us, uh, another reporter, and he turned to us and said, "What the heck is Army doing? If they're going to call uh, that play there, they might as well throw up the white flag." So it was a little odd seeing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Steve, any other thoughts on um, on kind of the closing drive for Army? They, uh, I mean, they're not a great two minute drill team, but you know they uh, just didn't try. You know, I guess you know that's where maybe you try a pitch play because you can still get the ball out of bounds. And they went with uh, with pass plays. Anything, Steve? Yeah, no, I. <clears throat> I don't have anything on that series. I, you know, I was, I was, it's still, it's still too painful. It's still too painful. I, you know, we, we just didn't, you know, one of the, the one comment I have about, about all of this, and I'll go back to the, to the, to the quarterback situation. There's only one thing worse than having a quarterback, having a team that doesn't throw the ball very much than having a, a quarterback a two quarterback system where one throws the ball and the other one does not. And, and when you bring that person in and obvious passing downs, I mean, our, we, we've talked about this a lot. We throw the ball the best like we did against air force when it's a second down and three, when, 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 when that, when that fullback fake draws everybody up and all of a sudden uh, Robinson's running down the sideline on a wheel route and we hit him long. That, that's what it works best for us. But when we're second and – I mean, excuse me, third and seven, and we pull Tyre out and we put Anderson in, all right, move the safeties back. You know, it, we're throwing the ball there. And, and it was, uh, un, you know, unnecessarily uh, uh, telegraphed every, everything along the way. And that, that final series, we just didn't have any rhythm. We just didn't have anything. And then, and then the final play, which I've already – you know, the, the dagger through my heart it's been that same play the entire year. Where we just, you know, we, we rushed into a quarterback keeper. We came up into short. Yep. Okay. Okay. Well, well, let's uh, we'll come back. Let's let Richard Miller uh, go through what are some of the upcoming bowl games. Why don't you go through the first, the pre Christmas bowl games to start, Richard, and uh, then we'll, which in. Okay, the pre-Christmas bowl games begin um, this Friday. Mail Tennessee State will be taking on Toledo. That's a 12 o'clock start. That's the Bahamas Bowl. The Cure Bowl will be Coastal Carolina and Northern Illinois. That's a 6 o'clock start. Saturday is the, is the Boca Raton Bowl. Western Kentucky is taking on Appalachia State. The New Mexico Bowl will have Fresno State taking on UTEP. Independence Bowl, UAB taking on number 13, BYU. The Lending Tree Bowl will be Eastern Michigan taking on Liberty. The L.A. Bowl will be Utah State against Oregon State. The New Orleans Bowl will be Marshall against number 23, Louisiana. The Myrtle Beach Bowl on Monday, December 20th, Old Dominion against Tulsa. The famous Idaho Potato Bowl will be matching Wyoming against Penn State, 3-3-30 game. Who's in that game against Tennessee, Richard? Uh, in the Idaho Bowl, the famous potato Idaho, Idaho Bowl, is that what it's called? Wyoming versus Kent State. Kent State, okay, from Ohio, State. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, the, the Frisco Bowl will be UTSA against number 24, San Diego State. The bowl we'll, we all are going to be keeping paying attention to will be on Wednesday. The Armed Forces Bowl, Army will be taking on Missouri 8, 8 p.m. The You'll be football. watching, Richard. What? You'll be watching. Yes, yes, I will. The Frisco Football Classic, Miami of Ohio against North Texas. That's a that's a three thirty game. That's the one that's, that's in uh, what? Uh, just north of Dallas. I forget the stadium name, but it's but it's Frisco. just north of Dallas. Uh, let's see, Frisco. That's all right. Okay. Well, oh, yeah, that's a Toyota Stadium. Oh, the, okay. What is that? The soccer stadium in the area in Dallas? Uh, might be. Yeah, sure. I think it is. Okay, keep going, Richard. Okay. Um, 
at Miami of Ohio and North Texas. The grass available will be Florida and UCF, 7, 7 o'clock, December, December 23rd. And December 24th, the Hawaii Bowl, Hawaii taking on Memphis in 8 o'clock game. And Christmas Day, there's a Camilla Bowl, Georgia State against Ball State. That's a 2.30, a 2.30 game. Well, uh, two teams that we've seen uh, this year. And uh, I think Ball State would probably be favored in that one. Okay, well, let's start talking a little bit of um, Army, Missouri. Army's got to get through exams. How tough is it to go play one game and then only have half a day to study, go through your notes or whatever, and then have a week of exams, and then they said they'll have practice again Friday afternoon. Um, how is what is that like at West Point? The exams are pretty tough. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if um, some of the exams were already taken. Um, there, there may have been some exams last week, or they may even snuck one in. Um, right before the Army Navy game to kind of lighten the load a little bit on that. But uh, it'll be tough to focus. But you you know when when it comes to beating the dean, you've got to you've got to do what you got to do to you know to stay to stay on board. You know, but you know the, the football players get to underload a little bit now. They go to summer school so that in season they don't have to take as many classes. So it should be a little bit more manageable. You know, my senior year, I had 21 credit hours uh, in football season, so that, that was legit. Uh, I'm not saying it's any less now, but I think there are 15 or, or sometimes 12 credit hours um, if, they, if they've overloaded in the summertime for themselves. Yeah, that's, uh, that makes a big difference. Coach Munkin was talking today about uh, some years, the week of the Army-Navy game, they've had exams going. Yeah. Um, and then obviously the year in 2018, uh, when they uh, they had exams up until a couple of days before they really the day before they got on the plane to go to um, to uh, the Armed Forces Bowl, and then what did they do to Houston? Scored seventy points on on them. What's it like for for getting through exams at West Point, Sam? It's a uh, it's an all encompassing experience in which you are completely immersed in your exam schedule, your exams, you don't get much sleep. And many times if they still do the exams like they did back in, in my day and probably in Steve's day, uh, in many cases you have more than one exam a day. Um, you, you'd have like a morning exam and an evening exam. So you would be studying the night before all night for the exam that morning. And then you would be studying all afternoon for the exam that night. And then you do the repeat cycle because of the amount of hours that, that you were uh, enrolled in. And um, it's, it, it's, you know, for, for people who are not familiar with, with the service academy at uh, academics and, and most notably West Point, um, people in civilian colleges tend to think that uh, you know, taking 12 hours a semester or 13 hours a semester is a full load. These cadets uh, typically have anywhere from 17 to 21 or 22 hours every semester that they are required to be enrolled in. And on top of that, they are performing all of their cadet activities, whether it be core squad athletics, that's as in varsity sports, uh, and the practices and games that that involves, or it could be drill and ceremony practice that they have to participate in if they're not in season. It could be intramural athletics, which is mandatory. Uh, it could be uh, extracurricular activities like maybe Sandhurst and, and some of the clubs that you're involved with. Uh, not to mention all of the formations that you have all through the day, which are mandatory. Uh, and the uh, set schedules that are controlled by the dean and uh, by the comm and the superintendent. So it is a very busy, you don't get much sleep. And it's probably why if you've ever been around cadets, you're probably amazed at how quickly they will be able to sleep in just about any position, anywhere, anytime, any place, without any hesitation. It's because they don't sleep. They don't get a chance to sleep. They're very tired all the time. This does roll off onto the field of friendly strife when the uh, 
you know, the athletes are actually out there performing. They have to deal with this lack of sleep. So yes, there are some accommodations made for uh, athletes who are in season in order to help them out a little bit, but they can only bend it a little bit, not much. So uh, it's going to be a challenge really for the team to get ready for uh, the Armed Forces Bowl because of the amount of time that the team is going to have to be spending their, their uh, paying their attention to academics as opposed to practicing and getting ready for the game. So you're going to see an Army team that has a very limited amount of work uh, preparing themselves for Missouri, uh, very little prep squad practice uh, against the prep defense and the prep offense. And um, that's why it's probably going to be uh, a game in which you'll see uh, a lot of uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, full gamut of, of plays and, and reads and schemes uh, on full display until the coaches adjust to figure out what's going on. But uh, it's really because the players their first their their first responsibility at West Point is uh, to graduate a commission as officers in the Army. It's not to play football or whatever other sport they're playing. And so when, when the dean calls, they've got to pick up the phone and answer, and they do. And uh, once they complete that call, then they can pay attention to the uh, core squad athletics that they are a part of and in season. With. And a new dean this year, too. Um, <clears throat> uh, so it's uh, probably a little bit of an adjustment. Uh, one other, you know, Jack and I were out on the field for the pregame, uh, you know, and, and we met a few people, uh, one of whom, I, you know, I was really thrilled to meet, uh, Gary Steele, uh, oh, yeah. the first um, African-American uh, starting player for the Army football team at tight end. And uh, I just had a chance to talk with him briefly, uh, but uh, that was a big moment for me. I really enjoyed that. Uh, Sam or Steve, do you know uh, Gary Steele? I've, I've met him on a number of occasions. Just an incredible, uh, inspirational guy. Uh, just, to, I mean, I, when you watched him play, I, I was, um, I, I've watched a lot of his highlights. I've watched a lot of his film. Uh, just an incredible athlete. Um, and just, uh, you know, just an all around good man. He's a, he's a part of the Army Football Club. Uh, a big part of the Army football brethren, and and we're, you know, he's just, just a, and and and, and his daughter's super successful with ESPN, and yeah. it's just a, an incredible powerhouse of a family, and just, you know, just an honor to be able to talk with him and him to be a part of the same brotherhood. That's that's Sage, that's Sage Steele's father. When when Steve was mentioning yeah. his daughter, his daughter Sage Steele. Correct. Yep. Yeah, she was on the sideline. I just didn't know who she was. Richard watches ESPN more than I get a chance to. <laughs> but, uh, Sam, a question for you. Uh, Jack and I were out on the field. Jack was doing video of the march-ons for both the Corps and the Brigade. Uh, you can watch that on, on this Facebook page and also my YouTube page. Uh, what goes into preparing the march-on? Uh, you were describing it earlier. Um, they come off with tremendous precision, very impressive. What goes into making that happen? The week, uh, Army, during Army Navy week, and in addition to all the other crazy activities that are going on in the pep rallies and antics, uh, uh, after each academic day, the uh, Corps cadets will assemble out at an athletic field. And when I was a cadet, it was out at Daly Field, um, where there was a, uh, a soccer and lacrosse field. Um, that uh, was approximately the same size as a football field. And uh, we would rehearse uh, three, four, sometimes five times a day doing the march and following the commands and making sure that everything was done with the utmost precision so that by the time you actually do the main event on Army Navy Day, uh, it's been rehearsed uh, 20, 25 times at least. Really? So there is wow. no really yes um, i was thinking three or four would be a oh, lot no 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 now i'm speaking to when i was a kid at i'm not speaking to today so keep in mind that uh even though i don't look it uh i graduated uh, uh over 30 years ago so mm -hmm. um 
And, and what that means is, is I'm talking about the Corps of Cadets in the 80s, not the Corps of Cadets today. So there may be a little bit of a change in the way that they prepare, but it's still obvious when you watch the march-ons that Army puts a considerable, considerably more effort into making uh, precision important in how they present themselves with military discipline um, in ranks when they do their march-ons as opposed to the brigade of midshipmen. So one thing is crystal clear, Army wins the march on every year, every year. So if you want to watch a pretty gaggle, sharp out there. And yeah. we were right by Holland Pratt, the first captain. And uh, I, she just kept, once she got out into her position, it probably takes about seven or eight minutes for the rest of the Corps to fill in before they start the cheers. And she just must have picked a spot in the stands and kept her eyes on that, didn't, was absolutely motionless. And I'm sure in her mind, she's wondering, is everybody filling in, doing what they're supposed to be doing, like they rehearsed it? Uh, what do you think that moment is like, Sam or Steve? Well, I mean, it's, uh, they're, they're, well, I, you know, so to, to, to back Sam uh, up on what he was talking about, because I, uh, I had some people that passed me on what the schedule looked like for, for game week. Um, they, were, they were practicing at Shea Stadium down with the 150s practice. Um, that's where they were doing a lot of march on. And then they actually did some, some work up at Mikey. So uh, there was that, that type of uh, period of the time where they were doing the, the practicing. You know, when you when it comes to parade and parading and, and those type of things, and, and for, you know, there'll be people that'll be watching this and be laughing because I think I, I marched in two parades in four years. So, uh, but but they, uh, and, and I'm proud of that. I, I, got, I got the t-shirt, but they, uh, um, they they take it really seriously, uh, and when it comes to, to being a part of the staff and, and being a part of the, the leadership, uh, when when they're that serious about it, they will lock in. They won't move. They'll do those type of things. Obviously, the first captain wasn't out drinking the night before because that would make you you know a little weak in the knees. But uh, but uh, that that is a uh, uh, something that you know, I think we take. Pride in, and each year there's always photos of, you know, from the end zone of how we're lined up and how it's all dressed right, dressed, and how the Navy's lined up, and it looks like a, uh, you know, they're waiting in line for vaccines or something. So it's a, uh, it's it definitely we take a lot of pride to make sure we don't get a bad photo. Yeah, and, yeah, I've got it. Go ahead, Sam. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, I have a funny story about March on now. Mm -hmm. uh, I I hear Steve, you know, uh, uh, when I back when I was a cadet and when he was a cadet, uh, the football team was in season all, they, they were a core squad in season all year long. Um, 150s, the sprint team was only in season when we were in season. And then when we came off of, of our regular season, we went straight into the core and we were tagged for marching and everything else. So unfortunately I did have to march and especially in the spring, but, uh, uh, definitely had to do the march on all four years. And uh, my yearling year, the game was in Philadelphia. And when I arrived in Philadelphia, uh, we were getting ready for the march on that morning. <clears throat> That's when I discovered I had forgotten my low quarters, my black low quarters that you got to wear with your uniform. And uh, I was in panic mode. And so one of my classmates, I was staying with his family and, and was asking him, is there, is there like a shoe store open on, on Saturday morning early? You know, we've got to go. I got to find a pair of low quarters. And they were all, you know, these, they, they were some South Philly guys. They were just laughing at me like, hey, no, there's no shoe store open. You're going to have to just, just don't march, which was not an option. I had to march. Well, it just so happened that uh, one of my company classmates had a broken arm. So he wasn't going to do the march on. Well, he had a pair of uh, like regular civilian shoes for going out that were black and uh, they could kind of pass as low quarters. But uh, if you look closely at them, you'd realize that they were not low quarters. So he loaned me his low quarters to wear for the march on. Well, I'm a size nine and a half shoe. He just happened to have the smallest feet in the cadet company. His were seven and a half. Oh, gosh. I managed to squeeze my <laughs> nine and a half into his seven and a half low quarters with the laces as stretched out as much as absolutely possible. 
screaming at my feet and did the march on with seven and a half shoes uh, just to be able to, sh to, to be in uniform for that march on and still managed to march with military precision and do my cadet company proud. But I'll tell you what, by the end of the day, I had the biggest blisters all up and down the sides of my feet uh, on everywhere you could imagine. It, it just, uh, if you wanna try it sometimes, strap on shoes that are two sizes too small on your feet and wear them around all day like I did that day. But it was comical. Um, just a nice little story about the march on. Yeah, I, you successful. know, we all have had that moment where we forgot something before a dress event. Uh, I forgot dress shoes for an event a couple of years ago when I'm driving to Buffalo. I had to stop in a store and buy some on the way. Uh, but I wasn't going to go through a uniform inspection, but, I, but I, we found that. Jack, what was your impression of being that close to the march on? Uh, uh, you were up close and personal as uh, 3,000 midshipmen and 3,000 cadets marched by. Very up close. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the pomp and circumstance of the game is pretty incredible. And uh, with the march on, you know, they walked right by us to the point where um, I had to move the tripod back um, uh, like a few inches. Maybe I had to move back a foot. Um, kept slowly moving back because they were walking right by. And I didn't want to hit them. Um, so it was pretty amazing. And um, I had to keep the camera going. I remember you were telling me when the color guard gets on the field, keep the camera on the flag. So I was trying to do that. Um, but it was pretty amazing having the march on and then having a flyover from the jets and the uh, Chinook helicopter. There was actually, I saw a video posted on the um, Army West Point Athletics Facebook page, which is a uh, camera shot. It was actually from the point of view of the helicopter flying over the stadium. Pretty impressive. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, when you're on the field there's so many you, know, you turn around there's so many uh, recognizable faces and i remember at one point i was filming and last week we had herman bowles on the football huddle and at one point while i was filming i turned to you and said uh, is is herman here and i looked over your shoulder and there he was like five yeah. feet away from me yeah yeah um, and all so the was, uh, usaa executives were over there yeah uh, wayne peacock and uh, and we saw admiral uh, bird and, uh, and uh, yeah, um, Herman is a, uh, a board member of USAA, mm -hmm. among many other, he's on a bunch of prestigious boards. And then I also met his son, Nathaniel, we talked a little bit, um, he was saying how difficult it was, you know, the passing of his mother this year. And uh, so it was good to uh, chat with them. Yeah, that was a movers and shakers moment. Uh, plus you had all the CBS broadcasters, uh, Said hello to Rick Neuheisel and uh, Coach Nutt. Uh, two, I think it's two out of three years I've said hello to him. Um, so, and then, you know, meeting Gary Steele and uh, a few others, it was quite an interesting. I, I do have to say, uh, Jack, who did we meet outside the stadium? Uh, that was the Secretary of the Navy, uh, Del Toro, Carlos Del Toro. Yeah, we actually saw him walk by with his entourage of, of handlers, and I, I quickly surmised who it was and that we had a relationship with him because his, he was commander of the USS Bulkley when it was commissioned in New York Harbor in December of 2001. And through the USO, we got a number of our post members invited to the commissioning ceremony. And uh, sort of a name that you know stands out in your memory. And then we was named Secretary of the Navy um, you know, we saw that, and uh, so we, we, we got about, I think we got a 26-second interview, which mm -hmm. isn't bad. Um, and, it was also, uh, uh, it was, it was, they did a pretty good job the pregame. Um, you, you were talking about, I remember, when they did the coin toss, and they were surrounded by the New Jersey State uh, police officers, wow. um, which is pretty impressive. Did and you guys then, see um, that when they brought out a hundred New York, uh, New Jersey state troopers to oh. surround the coin toss? I, they usually put a rope up. I've, I, that's when I said, okay, the president's going to be here and that's what their idea of security is. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, you know, it's for Lloyd Austin. Um, and uh, was there any other dignitary involved with, uh, with that this year? I mean, it's always said General Milley was out there. Mm-hmm. And the new secretary of the army was out there. Um, 
And uh, so I, but that was something I've never seen a hundred or, or more state troopers form a quad, you know, a, a square around a coin toss. That was, that was a new one. Yeah. Well, yeah, anyway, I guess kind of, we, go ahead. I was going to say it was also kind of fun to see the uh, prisoner exchange between the two academies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Holland Pratt brought out the, uh, the uh, Navy, uh, uh, midshipmen setting at an app at a West Point this year and uh, and retrieved the uh, her cadets that were studying at Navy this year. Sam or Steve, what is it like? How are those exchange students treated during uh, their, <laughs> their six months? That must be an interesting arrangement. I just wonder what is there like an initiation for them, a welcome to West Point? Well, uh, the exchange uh, cadets and midshipmen, um, their real uh, forge of fire happens the week that the week leading up to when the service academies play. Uh, other than that, they're pretty much welcomed into the corps or the brigade and, and treated just like everyone everyone else, except in different uniform. But during uh, Army Navy week, I, I can tell you the the. Uh, the brigade, the, the 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 midshipmen who are in the corps, for example, um, they go through a constant series of uh, spirit missions on the part of plebes and the cadet companies with which they're a part of that uh, just make it uh, borderline um, harassment. Uh, they'll find like their entire room has been rearranged and moved out to the central area. Their bed <laughs> is made and everything. Uh, uh, to uh, just just having themselves uh, tied down and 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 covered with shaving cream or or whatever, but uh, there's not a moment that goes by where they can't uh, relax their guard and not be looking over their shoulder to be ambushed uh, by a bunch of plebes on a spirit mission who are about to make their life miserable just for a few more hours uh, as we remind them that we're all about beating Navy. So and and of course the the. The uh, cadets who are at the brigade, they go through the same thing. But another thing those cadets do and those midshipmen do is they try to pull off spirit missions. Uh, you know, they'll band together and they'll make their plan and they'll try to, you know, like arrange a great big, uh, like a uh, big beat army out on the plane or something like that facing Washington Hall or, or go put something on the soups uh, stoop, you know, without anybody finding out that has something to do with uh, Army Navy. So it, it's a constant battle, but but when it's really the most comical and it comes alive is is during the week leading up to the game. Yeah, yeah, I saw the uh, Sink Navy sign uh, posted on on the top of uh, facade of Bancroft Hall at Annapolis, uh, uh, which may have been pulled off by some of those uh, exchange cadets from West Point. Now uh, I'm going to give Richard a task as we before we break. Richard, I want you to pick one game coming up before Christmas, other than we'll get to Army, Missouri next week. Um, but pick out another game, and we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll come up with some uh, forecasts on that. That's for, <clears throat> How about that That's game, for... Ball State and, uh, and Georgia State? That's what we, we know both of those teams. Where are they playing? Ball, Ball State and Georgia State? Ball. Yeah, where they? That's a good one. Let's see, Ball, Ball State. Let's see, they are playing this year. They they are playing at the uh, Cam the the Camilla Bowl. Uh, that's uh, that's on Christmas Day. Okay, well we got a little that's time, a, but Mon uh, Montgomery, Montgomery, Alabama. Montgomery, Alabama. Okay. You want to? Uh, you want to? Uh, Forecast on that one, Sam. Anything Georgia State, Ball State? You saw Georgia State in person. Mm. Yeah, um, you know Georgia State. Uh, they started out their season pretty rough, and um, but they battled back and, and earned bowl eligibility. Um, ball State did the same, but Ball State was unable to repeat as the MAC champions. So you know both teams are going to battle. Um, with pride to, 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 to put a stamp on their season to show that the rough start for the season uh, was not indicative of the team overall. 
So I predict a close game um, from watching uh, both teams. Uh, it's tough. Um, I, I think it's going to be pretty even, evenly matched. They both have some good athletes. They both have pretty good quarterbacks. Uh, I think maybe the edge is going to go to Ball State in the end. They're just a bigger team. Because um, one of the things that stood out to me about Army and Georgia State was that that was one of the few games I'd ever been to where Army actually had bigger players on the field than Georgia State along the line of scrimmage. And uh, I found that to be pretty impressive. But that was not the case with Ball State. So Ball State. I'm going to give the edge to Ball State. But the crowd size, you know, the, the, the crowd uh, base in the game is going to be Georgia State's favor. So that that could have an impact on the outcome of the game because of crowd noise. Okay. So you like Ball State. Um... Jack, who do you like in that game? Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, Ball State, I would give them a little bit of an edge in that one. Um, it was uh, – I couldn't remember. They had that uh, unfortunate win over Army early in the season. But, um, yeah, it was surprising that Army, you know, they're bigger than Georgia State. So, I, I like Ball State in that one. Steve, you want to do a forecast on that one? Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm right. I'm right there with all of you, um, and I think uh, I think Ball State's the, the way to go on that. Um, I do have another game that I'm pretty excited about, but we can talk about that later. But uh, but uh, but I, I like Ball State in that game, pretty big. Very good, Jack. Oh, we did. Jack said Ball State. Richard. Yeah. Ball Ball State. I I, I think I think Ball State is cl is clearly the better team. I I I, I like the running game. I think their passing game is pretty good. Ball State should win that game. Okay. Steve, Shalou, what, what game are you interested in? I'll tell you what. I, I wasn't giving much credence to UTSA until I saw them play their last game. And wow, was I impressed on how they could get that ball up and down the field. They're going to be matched up against San Diego State on the, in the 21st. It's the night before. Uh, the night before. I, I'll be moseyed up at a bar in Fort Worth somewhere. Uh, and I, we, we will watch that game. Uh, and, and, and I think, I mean, I like the way UTSA looks and, and how they, they, get, they can giddy up up and down the field. And I, I'm a huge fan of San Diego State. I think that's a great game uh, early in the bowl season. Usually don't get that good of a matchup. Very surprised it was that early. Uh, that's uh, Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Okay. Well, uh, maybe we'll uh, get together for that. Um and uh, hopefully I'll be able to get down there and we can get Richard and Jack in on the line. Hmm. Um, any final thoughts before we break? We got a week to uh, uh, get over our wounds from uh, the Navy game and uh, look forward to uh, Missouri from the Southeast Conference, a team that's beaten the likes of Florida this year. Um, and also a team that's going to have a full week of preparation where Army's going to be taking exams until Friday. So that's, that's another factor in Missouri's favor. Um, any final thoughts before we break? Yeah, yeah. I've got Go ahead, wait, Go yeah, ahead. I've got some final thoughts. And uh, it's, it's simply because we're all really frustrated right now. And, and the pain, it just runs deep. I always like to talk about that beat Navy feeling and how it lasts all year. Well, guess what? It, it ain't lasting this year. As a matter of fact, we're only in day two of feeling the pain of, of a loss to Navy. And as frustrating as a loss to Navy as this game was, uh, it, it's really going to hurt deep for a long time for a lot of grads, and especially the football players and the team. And then the former football players like Steve, um, you know, I still feel the pain of my first year in, in spring football when uh, we had Navy 21 to three in the fourth quarter and, and we lost. And mm. it, it just is a terrible, terrible feeling to live with. Um, and it is something that you have to live with forever. So uh, and it's something you never forget. But um, I just want to start by saying that I had a bad feeling about this game. And the reason I did was because of the, the attitude that I saw of the Army faithful. We had taken on that country club feeling. That entitlement kind of air existed among the Army faithful. The entitlement air was basically that feeling that, 
you know, we're entitled to win this game. We have Jeff Monken. We have a program. Our record is way better than Navy. And we're going to win. Well, it's okay to be confident. But one of the things I always have criticized, especially Air Force fans about, is that entitlement air that they carry with them. Army fans, please don't ever get this entitlement feeling. A win against another service academy is never a given thing. Never a given thing. Do not ever assume that it is a given thing and do not take on the air of that arrogance that I kind of felt coming from a lot of people. I ran into Greg Mogavero at Steve's tailgate and Greg, one of the first things he said to me was, he said, something about this game disturbs me. It's not a given. And I hope nobody thinks that it is. And I said, Greg, I am right there with you. I've got a weird feeling about this game. And the feeling that I had was derived from a lot of the people that I was watching and I was observing our behavior and the way we were carrying ourselves. Folks, don't be like Navy and Air Force. Do not assume this entitlement. Now, I want to put a positive spin on this for everybody because I want there to be some kind of gleam of hope for the future here. And that is, we're very tainted by the fact that Navy dominated this series for 14 straight years. And our expectation is a little lofty when it comes to academy football. Our expectation is that we think, and, and believe me, I would love it if it happened, that Army deserves to pay Navy back with 14 straight years of victories against Navy. I got, a, uh, I got a word for everybody. That's not what's going to happen. Um, as much as we would love it for, to happen. Let's take a look at several decades of Army-Navy football. If you look at uh, year one through 10 in the decades, so 61 through 70, the series went four, five, and one. Army, Navy, and ties. 71 to 80, Army went three and seven against Navy. 81 to 90, Army went five, four, and one. 91 to 0, 0, Army went six and four. Took over the lead in the series, by the way. From 0, 1 to 10, Army went one and nine. That misery continued in the first half of 11 to 20 when Army went four and six. And then going into 21 in the next 10 years, the expectation is that with Monken, we're going to carry a winning streak for the entire decade. Folks, if anything, what has happened is that parity has been restored to the Service Academy football series. Monken, watch my fingers, folks. He's four and four against Calhoun, he's four and four against Nematololo. That's what I call parity. Yeah, that's a good point. And yeah. the important thing to note is that in the academy football series, the only thing that matters is who won this year and who wins next year. Stop looking at the overall series between Army and Navy. That 14 years where Navy won 14 straight was a byproduct of the fact that Army football was allowed to deteriorate into a state in which it became the worst team in FBS football while well, the, at the same time the other yeah. two service academies were thriving. Yeah. Jeff yeah. Monken has, I know this game was frustrating, but I want you to just listen to what I am airing out to you folks. Jeff Monken has, in fact, restored parity to service academy football. And I can guarantee you that as long as he is the coach, Army has a chance to win every single time they line no, up against No, no doubt about it. Academy. Sam, I would say the fans may have been a little overconfident. We may have been overconfident thinking, you know, looking at the record, looking at the stats. But I know Jeff Munkin wasn't overconfident. He was on his players.
to be intense about their preparation. And I think they just ran into a, uh, an overachieving uh, Navy team on that particular day and some play calling that, uh, you know, we don't understand, but then we're not privy to who's, who's healthy, who's not, and what they can do. Um, I did say, and I hope you guys, maybe you guys will just check it before we break. We're going really long tonight. But um, I was on the Mad Dog Sirius radio show at 12 noon on Saturday with Dan Greca. And he asked me, is Army going to stay? Would Army ever consider going to a conference? My answer to him was no, no, and no. Uh, and I, I talked about the experience with Conference USA taking an Army team that was going to bowl games and deteriorating to one that had an 0 for a season. Uh, Ken? Yeah. Don't you mean Dan Dan Glossa? Oh, maybe that's it. You got it. Dan Glossa, the, the pregame host for the Jets. Oh, is he? Okay. Uh, yeah. see. Richard watches all this stuff. I uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just – but I was it was nice to get invited to do the show. We did seven or eight minutes. I kind of ran down the – key players on offense and defense and uh, maybe they'll invite us again. Steve, any final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, just just real quick. You know, in the last few years, and I think COVID has brought this to, to light, we've been so sequestered into our own homes and and, and hiding behind the the uh, the, uh, the 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 you know uh, social media and other things and listen, these kids wanted to win this ball game, and and these these kids that are out there, these young men, these 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 great young men ha have put it all out there, um, and they deserve all of our respect. Uh, and and th there was some nastiness that was going on in social media and those type of things. And you know, you, you don't hate the player, hate the game. You know, don't don't just understand that they would have given. Uh, uh, blood, if necessary, and some did, to, to win this ball game, and they're doing things that most twenty-year-olds uh, are, are not willing to do, and the sacrifices that they meet. Let's keep it all in perspective, um, and let's just be, you know, be be good to these players and be good to you know to each other on that. It's one of the reasons why I had to leave that whole area and had to come home. I just had to be in my own thoughts and in my own uh, uh, ability to process this uh, in, in a way that, uh, that that would work better for me. Uh, and, and I think some people, a lot of people just need to take a step back, take a breath. The sun's going to rise. Um, we're still going to love Army football. We're still going to love these players, the Dean Powells of the world, the Connor Bishops, uh, you know, the uh, we're going to love these guys. Uh, and, and just make sure the next time you see them, pat them on the helmet, say thank you. For, for doing things that most 20-year-olds are not willing to do and stand on top of that wall and, and do what they're going to do because they need our support during this time. And, and, and you know, uh, it's, it's great that we're in a country that can do these type of things and we can sit here and debate all this stuff. Uh, but we, let's put it behind us. Let's move forward towards beating the hell out of Missouri and, uh, and, uh, and just love on these players and let them know how much we support them. Absolutely. Okay. Jack or Richard, final thought, and then we are going to definitely break. Okay, well, um, it was a stat. I was, was kind of debating whether or not I should mention it, uh, but uh, Sam kind of mentioned the 14-game win streak with uh, that Navy had. The first win of that streak was in 2002 at uh, Giants Stadium. That was the last time um, the Army-Navy game was held at in the Meadowlands until just you know a couple days ago at MetLife, um, I don't think history is going to repeat itself in that case. You know, as long as Jeff Munkin's there, Army has a chance every single year. Uh, but on the positive side, it was in front of uh, this year, 82,000, uh, something rather was the uh, the attendance, huge attendance at the game, which was actually uh, an attendance record at, Mikey, at, um, at MetLife Stadium. Uh, the biggest uh, attendance for a college football game ever at, at MetLife Stadium, which is great. Uh, and wow. Another positive note is that um, although Navy won the game, um, a uh, commander in chief series is a three-way tie. So that trophy for now stays up at West Point. 
And what, how does that work, by the way? Jack brought up a good point. What happens to the trophy for the year? Can each school, mm -hmm. can, can West Point display it or, or can the other schools request it? No, it's, it's at West Point. But it's not quite the same. All right, well, they, they didn't win the commander in chief trophy, so, but 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 it's it's in it's in waiting. It's in the it's, it's in the trophy room. Okay, it's, Richard, it's laying in, it's laying in state. <laughs> yeah, that's the first time that it's been a three way tie in a, uh, quite mm. a while, quite a while. Well, I mean, I I think I, when we saw how Air Force beat Navy early in the season, that uh, uh, we thought that Army would be able to. Uh, uh, come out with a victory, uh, especially after defeating Air Force. So it's an odd mixture, but that's why it's unpredictable. That's why they play the game, and that's why it's so much fun because you're never sure exactly what's going to happen. Okay, Richard's going to have us watch uh, the Camellia Bowl in Montgomery, uh, Ball State versus um, Georgia State. And so anyway, thank you, Richard. Thank you for you're calling welcome. in from Florida. Jack McGurk from Pelham, and Steve Chalou from South Jersey, and Sam Houston from the Beat Navy studio in Huntsville, Alabama. And I'm Ken Kratzer for Sons American Legion Radio, and we are proud to represent the 2 million veterans of the American Legion, 330,000 members of the Sons of the American Legion serving America's veterans. Uh, so we'll find a time. I'm not sure when we're going to do it next week. We might have to do it Tuesday. Um, maybe we may all be traveling Monday to get down to the game. And uh, But we'll find a time, and we'll talk in more detail about Army versus Missouri in the Armed Forces Bowl. Thank you all for watching, and have a good evening.